Now, as I said, I've been doing this work for a long time, and I've been really blessed to learn with and from many great leaders. Many of you are in this room, people who have been my mentors and the people and people who I have had a chance to talk with and challenge me and for us to be able to have those conversations. And our next speaker is one of those people. Tony Porter is not only the CEO of A Call to Men, is not only an author, is not only an educator, is not only an activist working to advance gender and racial justice, to me, Tony is a friend who is someone who I look to for inspiration, who I look to for advice, I look to for support. We don't always agree, but that's not what our friendship is about. Our about is about our shared vision and our shared goal to move forward. I have such tremendous respect for his leadership. I have so much respect for his work to be able to do. Now we have this weird concept in our movement called engaging men. I hate that concept because it's a very low bar. <laughs> I mean, for men, we want to engage you, but we empower everyone else. <sighs> but what I see the work of a call to men is it's a call. It's not just about engagement, it's a call to be. And what Tony and his colleagues at A Call to Men and all the other people here who've been doing this work literally are, and I'm using this word intentionally, engender an effort for our passionate commitment so we can be able to take equity in action to be able to end sexual violence. So I am really honored to be able to introduce Tony Porter as our next speaker. Good morning, folks. It's a pleasure to be here. Yes, 2,000 people, this room is full. It's definitely a pleasure and a privilege. Pony, young sister, uh, I just love how fierce you are and, and unapologetic, exactly what this movement needs. Appreciate you, love you. And Alan, you know, as David said, I've been around here for a minute. I don't know how many of us in this room are ready for you and your research. But I do know there are many of us in this room who are ready for you and your research. So please, please continue. I really feel listening, <laughs> listening to the two of you, uh, as David has said, he won't say how long. I, I'm going to say, we've been here a minute for sure. Uh, but uh, when, I, when I hear folks like the two of you, I, I know we're in good hands, all right? So I love you for that. David and uh, Sandra asked me to share uh, uh, about my journey, and, and they entrusted in me to do that uh, when I you know, had several conversations with them leading up to this, and they, they wanted me to tell my truth. You know, I got, got a little nervous, cause, and I would have think they would have gotten a little nervous too because they know me for a long, long time, <laughs> and you know, but they said, no, Tony, this is where we're at, this is what we're trying to do, and we want you to bring your truth into the space. Uh, I, I started in this, this work, this journey, in the late 1980s. Uh, yeah, y'all could sit with that for a second. <laughs> in, the early 19, in the early 1900s, uh, <laughs> in 1990, I, uh, I was director of addiction services at a hospital in New York, a little town called Nyack, New York. It's about uh, 30 minutes north of the Bronx of New York City. Uh, I was doing quite a bit of, uh, along with addiction services, back then we called it substance abuse. I really appreciate, uh, today it's called substance use. Uh, it's people like Alan and, and the work they're doing that creates that shift in the language. 
Uh, I was doing quite a bit of anti-racism work. We were doing a lot of work around repealing the Rockefeller drug laws, right? Rockefeller drug laws, government, remember Governor Rockefeller? Yeah, in New York, uh, and, and we were seeing it around the country as well, but mass incarceration for small amounts of drug, mandatory sentencing. So I was doing a lot of work, the impact it was having on black and brown and financially poor communities in general, and it began to bring me into spaces where I started learning in a very intentional way what undoing racism meant and, and what that work was. Uh, so I started, you know, when, you, when you're doing any group oppression work, you'll find yourself in spaces with other folks who are doing group oppression work uh, that, you know, various forms of oppression. So I would find myself in spaces with a lot of, uh, a lot of women who were doing anti-sexism work. I became very attracted to that work and, and it became a calling for me. I started volunteering at offenders programs while still uh, working at the hospital. Uh, so yeah, I go back pre-1994, pre-1994. I mention that because uh, we're coming up on, right around this time, I believe it's September of next year will be the 30th anniversary of the signing of the Violence Against Women's Act. Right. So I was around back then, some of y'all were too, and you know what? Uh, I've been uh, getting real comfortable with the whole concept of let's give folks their flowers now. With that being said, if you were in the work during, the, during that time, pre or during that time of the signing of the Violence Against Women's Act, if you were in that work, you probably had a hand, knowing or unknowingly, in the passing of that act. So if you were here during that time, I want to ask you to stand up. Please stand up. That's like you, Adrian. Stand up. That's like you, Patty. Stand up. All right, and receive your flowers now. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you all. So what I was learning in those early days was that men's violence against women and girls was rooted in a patriarchy. Now, I still believe that largely to be true, uh, that the collective socialization of manhood teaches men to have less value in women, and we can see issues of equity and discrimination all built uh, and weaved throughout that. It teaches men that women are the property of men, which uh, is why domestic violence flourishes. It teaches men uh, that women are sexual objects, uh, and we can see the unfortunate impact of that as we continue to live in a rape culture. So while I believe in that, what was being left out and was really little, little space to talk about was the pathology of men. What was going on with male identified people? I, I sort of kind of get it. We were at a time where that if you left any space for doubt, any wiggle room, the powers to be, in many respects, white men, would take advantage of that. So women, female identified folks, were steadfast. Men's violence against women is rooted in a patriarchy and that's it. I get it, but at the same time, it created huge challenges in our work, right? Many, many challenges in our work. So when I hear Dr. Allen share the research, it really, really, uh, it leans into to where, where many of us are at today and uh, where, where I'm at as well. So I, I beg the question, you know, so what about the pathology of men? What, what about the experiences in their lives? What about the, the overuse of, of the criminal system? 
What about the impact of a race construct, right? When I first started doing this work, black and brown women, they, they would pull me aside and, and pretty much tell me straight up, you know, if you're gonna do this work, if you have a desire to be a leading man in this space, you better be ready to follow our lead. And I understood that. I understood that. One of my mentors then and still today, so that's, uh, you know, somewhere around 30 years or so, uh, is a sister girlfriend of mine, Gwen Wright. All right, yeah, that's right, and Gwen. Gwen is out of uh, New York, New York State. She's a mother in this movement for many, many, many years. And she would tell me, she would tell me, Tony, one of the differences between white feminism and black feminism is that white women want the police to do more and black women are concerned they're gonna to do too much, all right? That, that simple but profound statement has been a lifelong lesson for me in, in the work, all right? So through conversations with Gwen and, and many other sisters in, in these spaces uh, led to the decision for me to start the organization, A Call to Men. We started doing the work uh, in uh, pretty much the late uh, 1990s and we became a not-for-profit organization in 2002. Gwen has been by my side the entire time. Uh, she wrote the 501c3. She was the first board president for 10 years, and now she's on our advisory board, and we still stay very, very close in touch. She fought a lot of battles for us back then. A lot of battles. Uh, you know, look, we're, we're all friends here, so I'm just speaking my truth. I love everybody, but I'm just speaking my truth. Uh, and if you want to be mad, be mad at David. Don't be mad at me, be mad at David. <laughs> but back then, you know, it was, it was, it was sketchy. It was, it was challenging, you know. Men coming into this space uh, was challenging. You could be in this space if you were working in offenders programs. Of course, there was a lot of engagement with law enforcement and legislatures. That was places you would find men. but not, you know, in the advocacy space. And so, you know, I wasn't too welcome at, at the time. Uh, I wanted to do prevention work, with, which was challenging to those who were doing advocacy work, all right? Advocacy work, in many respects, was reacting to the violence. I wanted to get up, upstream in front of the violence. But there was a lot of concerns about me doing the work. First of all, it was attractive to funders, actually in the, in the signing of the Violence Against Women's Act, there was provision set aside to do prevention work. Uh, and, you know, and, and folks who, you know, all, all of the mainstream programs, they would get those funds and they was kind of building in many of them to the work they were already doing, you know, with teenagers in school around dating violence and the likes and those kind of things. But the whole notion of talking to men was a whole nother story. The idea of engaging men, as David said, being in spaces and talking to adult male identified people, that was a whole nother story. So it, it was a challenging time, but Gwen always had my back, right? And, and she stepped up and fought many uh, of the battles that were, were in, in, in our way. Uh, I'm also, I'm old school now, but you know, I was young then. I was real young back then. <laughs> Operative word, young. I was young. I still am a, a bit of a hood rat, you know. <laughs> I'm born in Harlem, I come to you by way of the Bronx, you know. I moved to Charlotte, North Carolina, listen to some crickets and stuff, be down there a little bit. <laughs> but I'm still all hood, all right? 
You ask any of the staff that have called the men, they'll tell you that. I'm proud of it. I'm proud of it. But it, it wasn't working too well for me during those times. So as I mentioned, even with the signing of the Violence Against Women's Act, where some provisions were designated to uh, prevention work, it didn't really create a lot of opportunities for us to be in this space. Uh, but we were able to still stick around, you know, and, and just hang in there. I want to say, as a black man, as a black male identified person, I can give a testimony on the love that black women have for black men. Now, sometimes it's to your detriment, because that love is deep. You know, you love us in many respects. You take care of us. You're in community with us. And then unfortunately, you, you find yourself having to protect yourself from us at the same time, and then you just keep on loving us. It's like a textbook definition of, you know, unconditional love. I, I've seen that similar love, because I, I spent a lot of time with indigenous folks, Latinx folks, API folks. I, I've seen that same love come from those sisters as well with the men of their communities. You know, and, and I know y'all hear us say communities, right? Black community, Latinx community, and did, it is or could be a geographical location, but it's, it's way deeper than that. It's way deeper than geography when we say community, you know. It's about the struggle. It's about our relationship, our connection, as it relates to erasure, colonization, enslavement, and all the other aspects of marginalization that we continue to struggle with, and this is the operative word, together. Right? There's a bond that black and brown people have together, as well as within our own cultural groups, that at times it, it surpasses, you know, the work of sexism, right? Racism some kind of times can trump that. Uh, and I'm not saying which one is worse or whatever, I'm simply saying that we have a bond for each other, a love for each other that can get twisted up when we're in, in spaces, particularly when it's time to hold men accountable uh, sisters do that, you know, in conflict with themselves. It's, it's, not, it's not a simple task. We have a film at a call to men called Intentionally Erase. Actually, we're going to have a showing of it uh, a little later on today. I think it's at 1 or 1.30 at that breakout session. And there's a sister in there. The film is uh, really about the experience of black men, black cis men, and uh, black cis men and black trans women really, really having a conversation around embracing the humanity of black trans sisters. And in that, one of the sisters named Brianna, she states, you know, when the boat comes, it's not just coming for us. She says, it's coming for all of us. And she was speaking about the importance of black people being united. And so we have that. Black and brown people, collectively, we have that. And that's been at the forefront of my work, uh, that relationship. And the sisters, I just gotta, I gotta take a minute to talk about sisters because of, you know, Sandra said go for it. David said go for it, man. I gotta talk about sisters, right? I was speaking to Beth Ritchie yesterday on the phone and she said, to me, she said, your job is to always speak truth to power. And she said, and remember, there are sisters in the audience where you're at today that for many reasons can't, right? So it's your job to do it. Since I arrived here, many sisters 
have been giving me a lot of love. People in general, but I'm, I'm taking a moment to talk about my sisters, all right? Giving me a lot of love, right? Candy Lewis, Adrian Lamont, Nicole Matthews, Nan Stoops. These are just sisters I've just been running into and all giving me love, right? Luce Marquez uh, Benbow, Rosa Beltry, just all loving on me uh, and encouraging me, right? Indira Nan, Ebony Tucker, again, just running into my sisters, the sisters from A Call to Men. We're a black and brown organization. My staff gets a little nervous when I speak about it out loud sometimes. But we're a black and brown organization, and we got a lot of black joy going on. They're here with me today, encouraging me, texting me, <laughs> getting on my nerves, right? But Heather Brain, Kenya Hall, Kenya Motley, and my dear sister, Lena Warbe Ugotella, who's been with me for 15 years at A Call to Men, right by my side, making this thing happen. So if it wasn't for these sisters, if it wasn't for black and brown women, I truly believe there would be no A Call to Men. If it wasn't for black and brown women, the engagement of men would be so limited, right? Their love for us, that unconditional love, that, knowledge, that belief in community is why it's very, very difficult for them to do this work, for them to do advocacy work without prevention on their mind and in their hearts. Right? So I want to talk just a little bit about a call. To, you know, before I do that, before I do that, I want to give out some flowers again. I want to give out some flowers, all right? All right. I want to ask you all in this room, I'm stretching you a little bit for some of you, but come on, y'all can do this. I want to ask everybody in this room who is not black or brown to stand up and give some flowers to these black and brown sisters and recognize them and their work and what it means for them to do the work on a day-to-day -day basis. I want to ask you to do that. If you're not black or brown, I want to ask you to stand up and recognize black and brown women in this space today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And some of y'all, you know, and some folks might be saying, Jesus, Jesus, why is he talking about them so much? I, I don't know. If, if, if that's you, you know, when we're done here, just go talk to somebody about it, right? Let them explain to you why, you know, and I, I don't mean to be facetious, but let them explain to you why we do that. I want to come back to some of where Alan, Dr. Allen was at and how that resonates for me in our work and how that leadership to do it this way, again, has come from the thinking, the teaching, the voices, and the leadership of black and brown women in my head and in my heart. Right, because what they taught me was, yeah, you gotta, while that choice is kind of woven in there to some degree, Tony, we gotta talk about pathology, right? We gotta talk about pathology of men, right? We gotta talk, we gotta move toward transformation of men. We gotta move away from transaction of men. We gotta reach into the hearts of men, right? That's where the work is at. Right? We got to begin to, we got to understand this, this violence that we're talking about. If one out of six men are also sexually assaulted, what does that mean? Right? What does that mean? And when we say hurt people, do what? Hurt. hurt people, right? What's that about when a boy is sexually assaulted at the age of eight and he can go a lifetime and never tell anyone what happened to him? What's that about? And what is he doing that entire lifetime? He's wrecking havoc in the lives of everyone that's vulnerable to him, right? So we have to really go at this work, this prevention work with a different heart, with a different soul as it relates to men. We have to work with men who have caused harm. Some of us are not ready for that work, but those of us who are ready, as Dr. Allen was speaking about, we need to be in those spaces. And we understand if you're not ready, we get it. But those of us who are ready, we need to be in those spaces. I'm out of time. So I just want to say in closing, I just want to say in closing that I am an unapologetic pro-black man. 
excuse me, I'm unapologetic pro-black women. I'm unapologetic about that. Now, it gets a little challenging at times, particularly with my brown sisters, but I want you to understand why. As long as white supremacy relies on a society that's rooted in anti-blackness, right, I have to be unapologetically pro-black women. And I need you to understand that. Doesn't mean I don't care about y'all. Doesn't mean I don't care about white women. If I am unapologetically pro-black women, and if I do that well, we all benefit from that. All right? We all benefit from that. So thank you for your time. Appreciate you.